Hello and welcome to this next problem in module 10 uh, looking at hypothesis testing with two population means. Uh, I think I'm just going to jump right into this exercise uh, and uh, we'll address issues uh, as, as they come up. So here we're looking at the situation where of course many students like to choose courses based on where they're going to get the easiest mark. Uh, one student seems very certain that Prof Dell is much easier than Prof Bailey. In order to test this claim, you talk with other students who have taken courses with each of them. After talking with, I'm going to highlight important stuff here, after talking with 43 of Prof Dell's past students, you find their average grade was 69%. 57 of Prof Bailey's past students have an average of 66%. And here we'll assume that we know the population standard deviation of Prof Dell uh, uh, 0.12 and Prof Bailey uh, 0.14. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's formulate our test and let's just get uh, let's get into it. So again, we're going to be looking at a two population test. So I'm going to formulate this just like this: mu one minus mu two. This is always how we can start with these. Uh, but then, of course, the next step is to determine, well, is this an upper tail test or lower tail test? And it always, the, the answer is always, well, it depends. It depends on which population we label number one and which population we label number two. So I'm gonna, I want to set this up in a way that is most consistent with how the problem is formulated. And here I say one student seems certain that Prof. Dell is easier than Prof. Bailey. So to me, that implies that the average grade in Prof. Dell's class is higher than the average grade in Prof. Bailey. So I want to, in my mind, that sounds like an upper tail test because I'm testing that this is greater than this. So that sounds like an upper tail test, but only if I define this as Prof. Dell and this as Prof. Bailey. If I were to define these the other way, then that would become a lower tail test. So here I'm going to set this up like this. I can rewrite this as mu1 uh, mu1 is less than or equal to mu2, or mu1 is greater than mu2. Anytime that hypothesized difference, anytime that is uh, equal to zero, then Myself, I almost prefer writing it in a, like this rather than having that zero there. If you're testing for a, a specific magnitude of difference, then I think this is a more appropriate way to write it. But again, this, it's up to you. Uh, but if you're testing for a specific magnitude of other than zero, uh, I would never write it like this because it, it would just become uh, maybe tedious, I think, to interpret. Okay, so we're going to do this as an upper tail test. You know, another way, just before I forget, that might even make it easier uh, when you're setting these up is instead of saying, oh, okay, Dell uh, is going to be mu1 and, and Bailey is going to be mu2, you can actually just get rid of the subscript 1 and 2 and, and skip that step of really defining them and just say this is going to be mu Dell and just replace it with letters um, letters that have meaning of course that have some significance uh, and then it's a little bit easier I think to to keep track of which population is is what okay so let's uh, let's go ahead we'll do this alpha uh, 05 uh, justify our formulation well here I formulated this in such a way that if the uh, if the evidence supports the null hypotheses, uh, then my my classmate, this other this other student, uh, I don't have evidence to support the claim that that student is making. Uh, however, if the test uh, supports the alternative hypotheses, if I can reject the null and support the alternative, uh, then that provides some statistical backing to what this student is is claiming to be true. We'll say, well, I, I guess the the data does support this claim. Uh, if if the alternative comes out to be true. So calculate our test statistic next step. Okay, let's uh, pull out our formula. Z equals x bar one minus x bar two divided by the standard error. I guess the one advantage 
to using numbers instead of letters here is that the formula is always going to be x1 and x2. So you have to make sure, I guess, in your mind, even if you've used letters up here, D and B, this is 1 and this is 2 when you enter that into your formulas. So we can't, I guess, just completely overlook uh, the importance of, of those subscripts. So here I'm going to have, let's see, a sample mean for Professor Dell is 69%. I'm going to put these into decimals a little bit easier to work with. 0.66, our hypothesized value is different as zero, so I'll add that in uh, just for completeness. I know it doesn't change anything. And the standard error, Prof. Daily, Prof. Uh, Dell, sorry, is 0 0.12 divided by how many do we have of his 43 students plus, and that's squared, plus 0.14 squared over how many of Prof. Bailey do we have? 57. Okay, so hopefully I've got everything in there right. It's one of those things where, you know, you've got the formula and that should make it easier, but it's still important that you make sure you put the numbers into the formula in the right way. Otherwise, of course, silly mistakes happen. So I always start with the, the more complicated part of the calculation. So I'm going to start in the denominator uh, at uh, that 0.12 squared. So there's 0.12 squared divided by 43 plus 0.14 squared divided by 57 equals square root. And so I have in the denominator 0.026. And our numerator, this is going to be 0.69 minus 0.66, so 0 0.03. And then that's going to come out divided by 0 0.026, so 1.15. So 1.15 uh, is our final test statistic for part B. So let's, uh, let's go to our tables and we'll get the corresponding p-value. So here we're doing an upper tail test. Our test statistic is 115. So again, I have a positive 115. And if I look up 1.15, that gives me this region here is 0 0.8749 but this is an upper tail test so what I want is this upper tail so 1 minus 0.8749 and this gives me my p-value 1 minus 0 0.8749 1251 1251 now just to be sure we can go to the negative side negative 1.15 and there we go 1251 we get exactly the same results either way you are comfortable doing it that's fine so our p-value for this test is 0.1251 our rejection rule if the p-value is less than or equal to alpha we reject is that the case not with an alpha of 0.05 uh, alpha could be any number of things and we still wouldn't reject alpha could even be 0 0, uh, 0.1 and we would still not reject uh, so in this case uh, we don't have sufficient evidence uh, meaning that if the null hypothesis is true if this is true um, the possibility of obtaining uh, that test statistic so that those sample values uh, from that distribution, it's uh, it's sufficiently high that uh, I am not comfortable rejecting it. It's possible uh, that that sample came from that distribution. Uh, the probability of that occurring is sufficiently high that if I reject it, my exposure to a type 1 error is greater than what I'm comfortable with. So I am not going to reject uh, that null hypothesis 
Uh, so I cannot support this student's claim uh, that there is a statistical difference between the two, or at least that Professor Dell's grade uh, is uh, average grade is statistically greater than that of Professor Bailey's grade. So that's all there is to it. Uh, I think we've got everything. Oh, our critical value approach. I think uh, we've probably become experts now at Z alpha when alpha is 0.5. This is at 1.645 value. And so again, if I can just squeeze in here my little distribution. So here's that rejection space out here. That's 1.645. And my test statistic was 1.5, uh, 1.15. So somewhere in here is 1.15. That's in this do not reject space. So that's exactly consistent uh, with our p-value uh, rejection rule. So that's it. We're good. Uh, hopefully that all made sense. Okay, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.